Hello, everyone. Uh, if you're here for the watershed talk, you're in the right place. We will be starting our presentation right at six o'clock. So right now people are just coming in. Please feel welcome. Again, this is uh, a presentation about watersheds and protecting watersheds for drinking water. And we will start our presentation in just a minute here. If you're coming in, please make yourselves comfortable. Um, People will be coming in for a minute or two, so please uh, welcome everyone. If you're here for the watershed discussion this evening for the presentation regarding clean water and forestry, you're in the right place. So hold tight, we'll be starting up in just a few seconds here. I think people are still coming in, so giving it about another five, four, three, two, one second. Okay, so now we're ready to start the presentation. Good evening and welcome to Forests for Water or Timber, a clear-cut problem. And this is a presentation by retired forester and forest ecologist, Herb Hammond. My name is Phil Blanton and I'm the moderator for this evening's event. Uh, we expect us to run about an hour and a half until 7.30. First, we'll have some quick introductions from the organizations that helped put this event together. Then I'll introduce Herb Hammond and he'll make his presentation. That'll run about an hour. Following the presentation, we hope to have roughly 25 to 30 minutes for question and answer. Then a concluding word for, from NCCWP's president, Nancy Webster. About the question and answer, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen and type in your question. I'll ask as many as we have time for, and that's after the presentation. And for the best chance of having your question addressed, please submit it before the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to start by introducing Anna Kaufman, Astoria Coordinator for NCCWP, or North Coast Communities for Watershed Protection. Please welcome Anna Kaufman. Thanks, Phil. Hi and welcome. My name is Anna Kaufman and I'm the Astoria Coordinator for North Coast Communities for Watershed Protection. I'm currently speaking from the ancestral lands of the Tillamook and the Halem, Halem First Peoples. Today, they are members of the Confederated Tribes of the Clots of Nehalem, the Grand Ronde, and the Silas Indians. North Coast Communities for Watershed Protection is a grassroots citizen group that was founded in 2012 in Rockaway Beach in response to the mass clear cutting and pesticide spraying of their primary source of drinking water at the Jetty Creek Watershed. Since 2000, it's been 90% clear cut and sprayed aerially with pesticides by private logging companies. These pesticides are showing up in the water. Carcinogenic byproducts from the high levels of chlorine now needed for sanitation are showing up in the water and people are getting sick from their own water supply. So as a group, our mission is to end all clear cutting, pesticide spraying and slash burning within the drinking watershed here in Oregon. And we have a petition going for this cause. If you're interested in learning more, there, there will be a slide at the end with the names and web, websites of all of the organizations partnering with us tonight. Um, but for the sake of brevity, I'll wrap up by saying I'm so excited to get to hear from the distin distinguished forester, Herb Hammond tonight. And before we hear from him, I'll hand it over to one of our wonderful partners, Philip Johnson, the Shoreline and Land Use Manager for Oregon Shores. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Anna. Um, very briefly, Oregon Shores has been around for more than 50 years. We work in the entire coastal region. We work on everything from land use planning and water quality to marine conservation, shoreline management, endangered species issues. So um, watersheds and water quality is, is one of many things we work on, but it's very important to our mission. So we're delighted to work with the um, uh, North Coast uh, Communities for Watershed Protection. Um, we're also perhaps uh, best known to many for our Coast Watch uh, Volunteer Monitoring Program, which surveys the entire uh, outer Oregon coast. When it comes to water quality, though, our primary focus tends to be in the lower watershed on, on uh, lower river valleys, estuaries, the near shore ocean. But of course, that links up to uh, NCCWP's primary focus on on uh, forest practices and drinking water quality. So there is a natural uh, match there and we're delighted to collaborate with them. Now I will hand this, well, I guess I'll just add, if you wanna learn more about our work, 
uh, just go to oregonshores.org and you'll find plenty. So I'll now hand this over to Taryn from the Peachland Watershed Protection Alliance. Unmute. Taryn, I think you're muted. Hi, everyone. I'm Taryn from the Peachland Watershed Protection Alliance. I'm on the unceded silk territory, also known as Lake Okanagan. And I um, was born in Vancouver, which was Squamish Musqueam territory. And I'm the co-founder of the Peachland Watershed Protection Alliance. Uh, it was a group started six years ago by community members who were just a little um, distraught with the ongoing resource extraction or clear-cut logging in our community drinking watershed. I mentioned Vancouver because it has protected watershed. So it's our uh, our aim as a 100% volunteer, nonprofit, science-based, community-driven group to bring those same protections to our community drinking watershed. So I'm really looking forward to this evening's presentation, getting more insight from Herb Hammond. Thank you very much. And I'm going to pass the torch over to Emily. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Emily Akdedian, and I'm with the Lower Nehalem Community Tr uh, Trust, joining today from Manzanita on the Oregon coast. And we're on the ancestral lands of the Clatsop Nehalem and Tillamook people. Um, and um, the Lower Nehalem Community Trust, we're a land trust operating in the Lower Nehalem watershed area. And we manage lands from the Forsyth Headlands at the base of Neokani Mountain down to um, properties along the Nehalem Bay estuary um, area. And our mission is to conserve land and nurture conservation values in partnership with an engaged community in the Lower Nehalem region. And we're delighted to be here with these wonderful partners. And we're really excited to have Herb Hammond joining us today. Thank you, Herb. And thanks, Phil. And thank you, Emily. And thank you, NCCWP, Oregon Shores, Peachland Watershed Protection Alliance, and LNCT. Thank you all for helping organize and support this presentation. As Anna mentioned, she'll be sharing a screen with the contact mem uh, information for all these organizations after we wrap things up. So please look out for that. Herb Hammond, tonight's presenter, is a forest ecology ecologist and retired registered professional forester with over 45 years experience in forest research, forest stewardship plans, consultation, and public education. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in forest science from Oregon State University and a Master's of Forestry in Forest Ecology and Silviculture from the University of Washington. He and his spouse, Susan, co-founded the Silva Forest Foundation, a nonprofit organization devoted to research and guidance in ecosystem-based conservation planning. Working primarily with indigenous nations and other rural communities, he's developed more than 25 ecosystem-based conservation plans across Canada and in other parts of the world. He's received Canada's Gold Award for Sustainable Living, and he's authored several award-winning books. And he's writing two more books now. Just over a year ago, Herb Hammond resigned from the Association of British Columbia Forest Professionals because he believes that association isn't living up to its self-professed ethical responsibility to protect public interest. Public interest, not the interest of timber companies. Forests are our largest terrestrial carbon sink, sources of irreplaceable biodiversity and provide the most effective water storage and filtration system in nature. Forests need to be protected, restored, planned and managed in open and transparent ways based on a combination of indigenous knowledge and sound Western science. Herb Hammond wrote that. Dedicating the protection of water as the first priority in watersheds that supply water for consumptive use by human beings seems like common sense to me. He wrote that too. Herb Hammond has a wealth of knowledge as a forester and forest ecologist, what he's seen and where he's been. And he has much to teach us about what's going on in the Jetty Creek watershed and what might or could happen in the future. Please welcome Herb Hammond. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to now share my screen uh, so that uh, we can start the presentation. 
Uh, first of all, I'll explain that I'm coming to you from the unceded territory of the Silk, uh, the Tanaha, and the Sinaixt. So let's see if we can make this happen. Okay, can everyone see that? Did that work? So far, we're not seeing anything. Oh, okay, let me try again. I wonder if I have been, uh, okay. Is that better? Excellent. Okay, you can see it now? All right. <clears throat> so uh, let me start by, by briefly saying that uh, forests for water and timber, a clear-cut problem is a bit of a play on words. Uh, and we'll, that will be a little clearer as I go along in my presentation. So, I'm going to, this presentation will have three parts. <clears throat> the first part is how water functions in natural uh, forests. Whoops, I mean, uh, my finger was going too fast here. The second part is how industrial forestry as practiced in Jetty Creek and uh, on the Oregon coast impacts water. And the third part is how to interact with forests in ways that protect and restore water. Uh, there are uh, a number of, uh, of photos here, which I have uh, looked at extensively, and I would like to give credit to uh, the, the to Richard Felly, Randy Olson, and others uh, in the North Coast communities for watershed protection. Uh, the images that aren't uh, of the Oregon coast directly are, are my images. So when we think of water, we need to remember uh, in a forest or any kind of an ecosystem, <clears throat> but it's particularly dramatic in a forest, it starts with drops. Uh, and those drops come together in webs uh, of ecosystems from very small soil webs uh, to large landscape webs. And those webs uh, tell us something important about water. Water is the connector. It, it literally are, can be seen as the veins and arteries of earth. And when we bring that back to ecosystems, what we're really acknowledging is that ecosystems are a living fabric woven together by water. Uh, if you look at that, uh, the water on that spider's web, you can, you can also think about what happens when you start taking some of the strands out of the web. Uh, it will appear to be okay for a while and then it falls apart. The uh, area that we're talking about on the Oregon coast has been classified <clears throat> by ecologists as seasonal rainforests. Uh, and what characterizes those rainforests is that rainfall is distributed primarily in the fall and winter. There's a relatively dry summer that usually has about less than 10% of the annual precipitation that falls during that period. The, an important take home message of that is that intact forests are, are in these seasonal rainforests are critical for water conservation particularly in the summer uh, and early fall. Th those are at times where th there's a potential for drought. That potential is going to grow as the climate change, imp as climate change in impacts grow. So uh, that, that to reinforce that, we, we need to think about protecting <clears throat> intact primary forests. That the, was the natural character uh, of the, the coast range uh, and uh, the areas where you lived before extensive forestry and logging occurred. Those primary forests uh, carry out the best water conservation of virtually any ecosystem, period. 
They are also uh, excellent at carbon collection and storage, also being amongst uh, the most effective ecosystems in those uh, ecological duties. And they have the highest level of biological diversity. Interestingly enough, they have species that aren't found anywhere else. Uh, and some of those species are carnivorous species that eat other species like bark beetles that eat trees. So I want to now kind of turn to uh, back to the, the water drop that you saw at the beginning. Uh, it really, uh, you, we can trace how water functions uh, in a healthy forest ecosystem by following the water movement of drops. First of all, what happens in a forest is water is intercepted. And then after interception, it's gathered and stored uh, by the foliage uh, of, of the forest. And then another interesting thing happens that affects not just a specific area, but a large landscape. And that is that it's moved. Uh, some of it evaporates or sublimates uh, back into the atmosphere and is moved uh, to other places. So particularly uh, in the area where you live, uh, in a, the, uh, on the headlands uh, where the Pacific Ocean <clears throat> meets, uh, that meets terrestrial land, that, that's really important to have that function of moving water because it's, it moves water across the coast range uh, into the Willamette Valley uh, and into the Cascades, for example. So if we, if we uh, interrupt that, we're, we're not just changing the water dynamics uh, along the coast where you live, but uh, also uh, inland as well. So once that, that water is gathered, it's then released. And that release is, is something that's timed. It doesn't, uh, it's, it, it's not like uh, turning a, a, a hose on, on the ground or something. It's back to those water drops that drip and slowly release into the system, which enables the system to, uh, to have a steady flow and high quality water. So in other words, it drips into the system. Uh, the tree crowns and lower plants receive that water and eventually it finds its way into the soil, groundwater and streams and other water bodies. So kind of keep that picture in mind as, as we move along uh, through this presentation. Leaves. Uh, in this case, uh, needles uh, on a Douglas fir tree intercept and store that water as the diagram uh, or as the image before showed. The more leaves there are, the more interception and storage. So there's a very uh, direct understanding from that, that if you have big trees with multi-layered canopies, they're going to intercept and store more water than little trees with fewer leaves. And that's important that the, the having more leaves and more storage because it provides it for moderate flows in, in the streams around that uh, emanate from these forests uh, throughout the year. Another important aspect about water and forests is that decayed wood is the the water storage and filtration system uh, in a forest. Uh, if you take away the decayed wood, uh, then you take away that function. And it literally provides not only water storage and filtration, but the foundation for future forests. Keep that in mind when you think about the idea of clear cuts followed by short rotations, followed by more clear cuts, and so on, which is the plan of industrial forestry. And that tells you that eventually you lose that decayed wood. Uh, it, it, at first, it doesn't seem like it's a problem because there's been thousands of years of building up a biological legacy. But uh, it, we've learned in many cases 
that that's easy to wear out. Attached to that, that decayed wood in many cases are a, a whole variety of fungi that are connected through below ground networks uh, to the roots of, of the trees and other plants. So they, uh, in that way, fungi really uh, shape the character of forest landscapes and, uh, and the, the very nature of, of forests in general. It's, it's important to, to remember that we need to keep all of the, the parts in that system in order for uh, fungi to do their work. Intact riparian ecosystems, the, the wet forests that uh, grow densely adjacent to streams, uh, rivers, lakes, wetlands, uh, are, regulate the movement of water and energy into water courses. They're almost like a voltage regulator. Uh, they can take, uh, when they you have healthy riparian ecosystems, intact natural systems, uh, they collect uh, all of the energy that comes down uh, the, the slopes to them and then slowly release it into the system so that it doesn't overload the system with energy. Uh, and in the case of, uh, of drinking water, doesn't overload it with silt uh, or sediment that can uh, cause large problems for drinking water. So if you think about it this way, from water drops to year-round streams, healthy watersheds require the composition, structure, and function of intact primary forests. Uh, I, I mentioned that in different ways a couple of times, but it bears repeating because we, we can't dodge that bullet. That's, uh, that's an ecological reality that needs to be front and center when we talk about uh, maintaining the health of watersheds. The seasonal rainforests uh, that we are, are talking about tonight uh, are keeping those normal summer uh, uh, and fall low flows are critical to maintain watershed health. So that's that's another thing that uh, or another aspect of the importance of intact natural forests. How is that achieved? Well, uh, here's a few ideas for you to think about. Old and old growth forests uh, are, need to be there. There need to be intact riparian ecosystems. Uh, shallow subsurface flow in soils needs to be protected. So for example, if you build roads or skid trails or things that, that interrupt that flow, then you can uh, disturb the, the shallow subsurface flow. Groundwater re recharge areas, for example, like water in faults, uh, also maintain those low flows. Wetlands and lakes are also uh, other key ecosystems that contribute to that, that steady low, low flow. And atmospheric uh, moisture interception like fog drip is another way that, uh, that, that feeds the, the, that, those low flows. But uh, the, the, and the, the key thing about that, in order to have effective fog drip, you need to have lots of those needles and lots of water drops. Uh, in other words, older forests. So if we look at Jetty Creek, <clears throat> which is uh, quite a small watershed as, uh, as uh, the size of watersheds go, uh, it's about uh, 1,344 hectares, acres or 544 hectares, which is not a big watershed. It's small. It has steep sidewalls, and it's an ecologically sensitive area. And not a, those are kind of are the ecological factors. But on top of that, it's also a municipal water source. So it has even a, a higher priority for protection of water quality, quantity, and timing of flow. So 
we can look at that top picture in 2004, where mo most, if not all, of the area had been cut at at least once, and maybe in some cases twice, as a recovering forest. Uh, and if we know some of the, the things that we've been talking about or apply the things we've been talking about about watersheds, then there should be a big flashing yellow light there uh, that we need to protect uh, the, the regrowth, uh, the, the reestablishment of natural systems there. But if you turn to that picture in 2013, that isn't what happened. Uh, that it, it, when I look at that picture and look at the extensive area that's been clear cut, uh, it makes no sense to me that anyone involved in planning that would have been uh, would have had the audacity to suggest that that's protecting water. Uh, in my opinion, it's doing the exact opposite. So there's there's been virtually a near complete loss of forest composition and struct structure and function that are necessary to maintain high quality water. This is just another view of the Jetty Creek watershed to show you the, the, uh, the complex topography and steep sidewalls that you can see, uh, particularly uh, in the Southern uh, part of the watershed itself, but uh, up it also extends up into the headwaters as well. So the upper elevations uh, of Jetty Creek get to uh, approach anyway, about 1200 feet. And in those elevations, there's going to be a mixture of both rain and snow in the winter. Uh, and where that, uh, that the line is of snow versus rain, uh, it, it probably varies a fair amount from year to year. And those of you who live there would, would have a much better idea than I of where that elevational change is. But where snow uh, accumulates in those systems, that will, will lead to rain on snow events, which the energy of the rain hitting the snow melts the snow much faster and results in high peak flows and floods which all, also destabilize uh, the banks of streams uh, and introduce turbidity or uh, sediment into the water. So I think looking at the, the watershed from a hydrological standpoint as one that is a mixed rain and snow dominated watershed is an important precautionary consideration, uh, and particularly given the, the fact that rain on snow events can be quite uh, quite detrimental uh, to downstream water users. And, and for that matter, the stream channel and the watershed in general. So let's, let's look at, at one of the clear cuts uh, in Jetty Creek to start thinking about what some of the impacts are. If you look at that, 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 photograph, it shows a loss of water interception, storage, and filtration. Go back to that, that diagram that I used at the beginning that shows the movement of drops in the system. That's uh, been totally removed uh, by this kind of forestry. If you think about the fact, uh, or an important fact about watersheds, is that a watershed can be as small as, uh, as a small uh, dimple in the Earth's surface, but it all, they also multiply uh, in, as they join together in a way that you can see the whole Earth as a watershed. So I put a couple of arrows here on some sub-watersheds uh, to the, the, the uh, an, another small watershed that's a tributary watershed to Jetty Creek. And you, so you can see if, if you understand that relationship that we're always dealing with a whole watershed, no matter what scale we're looking at, that there are entire sub watersheds that get logged. So those storage systems then multiply together where they've been logged to re result in cumulative effects that are detrimental to water. 
also uh, uh, visible in these these small sub watersheds uh, are the totally totally lacking uh, or totally missing riparian ecosystems. So as that the energy from a storm moves into that system, there's no riparian ecosystem there to regulate it. The other thing that happens in in these situations is that roads and or or skid roads, uh, any kind of 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 uh, of facility or or aspect of logging that cuts across the slope interrupts interrupts the downslope movement of water. So, in other words, we move from dispersed flow of water to concentrated flow, and that's going to end up with increased surface runoff, increased erosion, and a potential for landslides. So concentration of water by, by roads and skid roads and, and other kinds of logging uh, infrastructure that cuts across the slope is a, a, a really big problem because it's, it's changed the, the natural uh, function of the system to disperse water throughout the system in ways that maintain its, its integrity and health. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it, the, 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 the concentration itself uh, leads to a large amount of, of sediment moving into, into watercourses where we don't want so much of it. If we think about uh, this kind of forestry being done uh, at the the at the snow line the the where the, the part of of Jetty Creek in the in the winter that have that where snow accumulates clear cuts uh, in those in in that accumulate snow collect thirty percent more snow than is found underneath an intact forest. That goes back to the those leaves that we talked about because that snow is in, uh, up thirty percent or more, sometimes as high as forty or fifty percent in in certain situations, is collected in those canopies. It, it is evaporated, uh, or uh, or and or sublimated <clears throat> out of that system and moves somewhere else. So uh, that increased snow, which melts 30 to 40% faster in the spring or during those rain on snow events that I mentioned, will also increase peak flow and erosion. This is uh, another picture of, of <clears throat> the coast range uh, and, and, and forestry uh, in the vicinity of, of the, the North Coast. And here you can see a very large loss of forest composition, structure, and function that's needed to conserve water. It's hard for me anyway to find any example in that picture other than very small remnants of intact natural forest ecosystems. There's, uh, the, the, along with the loss of that composition and structure goes a loss of carbon sequestration and storage which exacerbates climate change, will dry out the system and make uh, the, the importance of water conservation even more paramount uh, than it's always been. This also results in what is referred to as irrecoverable carbon. Uh, irrecoverable carbon is, is simply the, the, the fact that the time to recapture the carbon through photosynthesis in trees and uh, and other vegetation in the forests uh, exceeds the time that we have remaining uh, to avoid the worst impacts of global warming. That's something we don't think about. I mean, lots of people uh, say, well, plant more trees and everything will be okay. But irrecoverable carbon uh, is definitely in the way of that. And that's then coupled with the fact that timber harvesting is by far the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Oregon. The same thing is true in, in British Columbia. Uh, so it, it's so we, we get a double whammy here uh, 
of not only uh, uh, negative effects to water, but also exacerbation of climate change. So let's take a quick look here at tree plantations. First of all, it's important to remember that clear cuts are not forests. Clear cuts are uh, no more forests than wheat fields are grasslands. They don't have the natural composition and structure that uh, makes up a forest. They're also uh, sources of the irrecoverable carbon that I spoke of briefly. Uh, there is a, a lack of crown mass to intercept, store, and redistribute water. So think about that important function of those drops and how that moves through the system and the fact that you need more leaves uh, in order to, to carry out those ecological functions well. Uh, they have a, a very homogeneous composition and structure, which reduces biological diversity and makes the, the, the plantations more susceptible to the stresses of climate change, uh, to the, which bring with them things like, uh, like insects and disease uh, that can uh, definitely affect, negatively affect the plantations. And then we kind of heap uh, injury or, or more injury on that situation by then trying to uh, eliminate disease and, and, and insects with pesticides. So uh, the answer to this, this to avoid avoiding those problems with tree plantations is to stop clear cut, short rotation timber cropping. In other words, we should see plantations as an opportunity for ecological restoration. And if we now look at second growth tree plantations, uh, new plantations and clear cuts that you see in this picture, we can uh, learn from recent research that, that, say, that tells us that the average daily stream flow in summer in basins with 34 to 43 year old plantations, uh, which you can definitely see in this image, was 50% lower than stream flow from reference basins with 150 to 500 year old forests. Uh, these come out of forests dominated by Douglas fir, Western hemlock and other conifers. So they will be very similar to the kinds of forests that, that you are dealing with here. So I, I think that, that there's a lot of ways when you look at the hydrology of these systems that there, there is a need to maintain uh, those intact forests or in your case to restore them in order to rebuild the health of uh, watersheds and, and the water that, that is produced by the forests in those watersheds. So, uh, the other thing to point out about this, as climate change dries things out and we're all faced with some level of drought, uh, compared to intact primary forests that have multi-layered canopies and canopy gaps, coniferous tree plantations are the most flammable when it comes to their, their composition and structure. So they can, uh, they not only contribute to drying out the system, uh, as we've been talking here, uh, uh, talking about here, but they also can be the source of very damaging fire uh, if if we're not careful. So there's an opportunity to let natural forests grow old. They'll conserve water. Uh, they'll provide mitigation and adaptation to climate change, and they'll protect biodiversity. This is a, a nice quote from, uh, from Norm Christensen and Jerry Franklin. Nature knows what it's doing and human intervention tends to make matters worse, not better. If we can let our forests be, we will reap many be benefits, include, including increased biological diversity, water conservation and recreation and fewer wildfires. That sums up a lot of what we've been talking about, about the importance of protecting intact forests, not just for water, but for a variety of reasons. So 
uh, the, I uh, was provided with these examples of herbicide spraying in the in the Jetty Creek watershed. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is an unnecessary forestry treatment. It threatens water quality. Uh, it also threatens the successional processes that depend upon uh, uh, the shrubs and herbs uh, and broadleaf species then uh, eventually returning to conifers. There's a lot to be said about that successional process. There's many benefits, but what pesticide spraying like you see here is doing is, is interrupting or disturbing that process. If vegetation management is needed, it's way better to use manual methods. It's more effective. Uh, it's actually more cost effective when you think about it, because it can be the the manual methods can be selectively applied, not over a whole area, but just where they're needed. Uh, and uh, unlike the the spraying of pesticides, that it doesn't have to be repeated the the manual methods if they're carried out right. However. The simplest solution is to stop clear cutting and use partial cut forestry uh, where timber extraction is, is ecologically and socially appropriate. There uh, is a, the, uh, the, the Oregon, uh, the community of watershed protection uh, uh, around Jetty Creek has documented well the use of pesticides. Uh, they've been ongoing for uh, for uh, at least a decade in, in in the system, and the, the there's uh, I, I been pesticide residue, for example, uh, in, found in raw drinking water, and those pesticide applications, as you saw in those earlier uh, or the slides a few a few moments ago, continue. One of the things that was noted in the chronology that I reviewed of this area is that uh, wow. in Lincoln County voters in 2017 passed a measure banning uh, the aerial pesticide spraying, but that was overturned by the courts. Uh, I don't know why, but it shows perhaps the power uh, of, of, the, of industry, both uh, the timber industry and the chemical industry in in uh, trying to use something other than pesticides in forestry. And also it's the, a recent study from Portland State University in 2021 uh, found pesticides used in forestry were de detected in clams, mussels and oysters along the Oregon coast. Uh, that's a pretty telling uh, telling uh, analysis to me because it's essentially saying if when once these these pesticides are put into the system they move they they're not something that is static like uh, oftentimes the manufacturers and uh, and timber companies that apply them allege this is just another example uh to show uh the herbicide spraying in the Jetty Creek watershed. And you can see here in this picture really clearly that it's a direct threat to terrestrial and aquatic habitat and to human habitation. This, this particular example to me is one that doesn't make any sense at all if you're concerned about water, uh, at other animals and plants and human habitation. So let me just Summar summarize uh, these forestry effects briefly before we move on to a potential <clears throat> solution. They, we're talking about removal of multi-layered forest canopy and the loss of water interception and storage. We're also talking about the loss, albeit uh, over a fair length of time, of decayed fallen trees and the their a function of water storage and filtration. Also the loss of intact riparian ecosystems, which results in increased turbidity, large sediment movement, and a loss of important biodiversity. 
Uh, remember when you, we work our way through these, these impacts uh, that watersheds, that Jetty Creek, for example, has many, many sub watersheds. And in, in many cases, uh, from the images I've looked at, those watersheds are completely clear cut. You're silly. Uh, silly. The, the, the also the concentration of water leads to erosion and landslides with corresponding degra degradation of soil and water. Slope instabi instability results as the roots of the stumps decay. When I look at those pictures of Jetty Creek clear cuts, though the, 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 the stumps still have their roots. And as those roots slowly decay, the sidewalls uh, where the roots went into the soil are cemented or, or water doesn't move into them very well. So that creates a whole bunch of water pipes they're referred to that when they fill, uh, they can actually saturate a, a portion of the slope and re result in, can result in erosion and in many cases landslides. Uh, the lo loss of carbon sequestration and storage exacerbates climate change. We know from research that after a clear cut, uh, there is basically no meaning, there's huge carbon losses that continue uh, and no meaningful uptake of carbon for uh, at least 15 years after a clear cut. Irrecoverable carbon uh, contributes to a accelerated effects of climate disruption, which we've seen in a couple of those images, and pesticide applications threaten water, successional processes, human health, and plant and animal habitats. So that gives us, uh, whoops, I lost, I forgot one last point here, and that's the flammability uh, of tree plantations and second growth forests, which I mentioned earlier. So let's uh, take a, a different tact here. How do we protect water? How do we put water first in systems? Well, it starts with values. Uh, it, it starts with uh, deciding on whether we're going to focus strictly on human-centered or anthropocentric values or look more broadly at earth-centered or what we refer to as concentric values. Uh, in the lower right there, you see a picture of Elizabeth Panashwe, uh, who is an Inu elder, uh, uh, clear across the, the continent here in Labrador, uh, whom I've worked with with young Inu uh, to implement the kind of earth-centered values that uh, Inu culture uh, had, has practiced for millennia, as have many indigenous cultures. So I, I think Buckminster Fuller has some wise advice here. Uh, you, you, don't, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's a little bit what I'm trying to show you here uh, in the third part of this presentation. I, I'd like to see what I refer to as a nature-directed stewardship path to a new relationship with forests. That path is regenerative. Uh, it's respectful, not only of, uh, of people, but most importantly, respectful of all beings, uh, all ecosystems. It's gratitude filled for all of the gifts that come from natural systems. And it's a reciprocal relationship with nature. It's not, it's not only thankful for what nature provides to us, uh, but we also return that gift in, a, in reciprocity with nature by helping to take care of her. That leads to nature-directed stewardship, which I'll <laughs> explain in a little bit more detail here. Uh, this is uh, a quote from Jeanette Armstrong, who is a silk uh, Okanagan person, ethical conduct within nature is based on reciprocity. Those words are uh, would literally change everything we do in a forest if we applied them. 
So nature-directed stewardship uh, has a, a couple of important principles. The first one uh, is focus on what to protect than on what to use. And what to protect are fully functioning forests, fully functioning ecosystems from the scale of this darning needle on a bluebell to whole watersheds. The other thing that we need to remember when we think about uh, forests and the landscape we, we find them in is uh, that they're a gift. We inhabit, a, as Robin Wall Kimmerer uh, points out to us, we inhabit a landscape of gifts, people by non-human relatives, the sovereign beings who sustain us. Uh, more humble words to guide uh, a, a humble uh, path and a respectful path in forests. So uh, a nature-directed plan or nature-directed stewardship uh, is based upon a really important hierarchical relationship. Economies are part of human cultures and human cultures are part of ecosystems. So if you play that back to yourself uh, and, and say that if you protect ecosystems, the land, the water, the air, all uh, life in that system, then you're protecting culture, which is kind of, uh, again, a bit of a no brainer. And if you protect cultures, you'll, you also protect economies because all an economy is, uh, are, is people relating to people providing the goods and services they need. There's a, an important thing to remember there there's an emphasis on need because we've uh, gone astray in, in what we call the global economy to focus much more on wants and to confuse wants and needs. So that hierarchical relationship guides nature-directed stewardship. And this is these are some wise words from Dennis Martinez, uh, who's uh, an, an an indigenous person that I've had uh, the good fortune to work with many times in carrying out restoration in forests. And I think the key part of that quote about concentricity or concentric values is uh, what's highlighted there in blue. There are no natural resources when those beings are your kin who must be approached with respect before harvesting. So that's that's something by, uh, by using a, 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 an, an anthropocentric or human-centered approach as opposed to an earth-centered approach. That's something we try to push aside, but try as we might, it will always be there. So an, another important way to think about forests is their identities to be respected, not objects to be dominated. Another important aspect of, of planning using a nature-directed approach uh, is, is to identify and respect ecological limits. Ecological limits are really just a, a practical application of the precautionary principle. It's the kind of thing that you would do uh, just naturally around your home or with your kids or, or in the landscape around you. So, some examples of that when it comes to forests, shallow soils, very dry or very wet sites, steep, broken, unstable slopes, snow dominated ecosystems, knowing where that cutoff point is, for example, in Jetty Creek, where uh, during parts of the winter, there's snow versus rain. Unique and ra rare habitat, where, where are the, the key assemblages of plants and, that are, and other plants, microorganisms, and other uh, living beings that uh, depend upon specific areas that aren't very common in an area. That's what unique and rare habitat is. We've created threatened and endangered species by, the, by our misuse, our uh, our application of very aggressive resource extraction in forests and other ecosystems. 
That's so we need to then remember these species in protecting niche areas within a forest, a forested watershed, or a large landscape. Riparian ecosystems, which we've talked about uh, more than once, uh, are also uh, areas that are de facto have ecological limits. They're, as I said, uh, function like a voltage regulator for the whole system. Old natural forests, which are becoming uh, increasingly rare and increasingly important to protect uh, at, wherever we are. And just natural intact systems, uh, intact ecosystems in general are becoming scarce. So they, that we define them as well uh, as ecologically limited systems. One of the, the key aspects uh, of, the, uh, of a, a nature-directed stewardship plan are networks of ecological reserves and cultural reserves. The cultural reserves uh, being directed uh, in our planning by the indigenous nations that we work with. Sometimes uh, they uh, are, uh, would, are open to the idea of cultural reserves. Other times, understandably, uh, they, they worry about loss of confident, confidentiality uh, of important systems. But in many cases, uh, cultural networks of cultural reserves are part of the whole flow. The other uh, aspect of, of ecological reserves and cultural reserves is they happen at multiple spatial scales. So from very large watersheds all the way down to fragments uh, or, or, or sub watersheds and fragments of sub watersheds. This diagram uh, from, uh, is from an actual plan that we did uh, with Inu Nation in, in what in Inu Amun is referred to as Nitasinan uh, or uh, in English terms, Labrador. And it just shows you how that you can apply this approach that I'm uh, talking about here from very large areas uh, that uh, are, uh, in this case, was, uh, was around five and a half million hectares, uh, all the way down to individual patches, which might be uh, uh, 20 hectares, uh, even as small as 20 acres or so. If you think about uh, how Jetty Creek fits into that multiple spatial scale reserve design, it's right here at the watershed or protected landscape network. If you look at that, uh, this Cape Caribou River watershed, all of the pink area are ecologically uh, sensitive areas that were excluded from consideration for timber extraction in this case. And uh, there Herb? was one small patch. About 10 minutes out now, Herb, just a warning. Okay, uh, it, that's 10 minutes. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, I'll, I should be able to wrap it up then. So the, the, this small block was also carefully planned to not use any clear cutting, but as the green stipples indicate different forms of partial cutting. So we've been talking about landscapes and watersheds. We remember need to remember they hold the patches. So what we do to the landscapes, we do to the watersheds. And you can think about uh, Jetty Creek watershed holding those sub watersheds or patches. And what we do to the overall watershed, we do to all of those patches. The goal is to maintain natural composition, structure and function through time. And an important thing to keep in mind in maintaining composition and structure through time is old is better, old and big is even better, old, big, and complex is best. So that means that old growth or primary forests need to be viewed as non-renewable resources. Uh, and we need to treat them that way in how we design our interaction with them. And our interaction then is going to be to protect and or manage uh, within ecological limits, watersheds to ensure that we protect 
and maintain water quality, quantity, and timing of flow. In this picture of a boreal forest, you can see all kinds of sub watersheds to other watersheds that connect in this case to the Athabasca River, which is in and of itself a huge watershed. When we protect or manage watersheds, we need to remember to see timber, minerals, tourism, urban development as byproducts. Uh, they're, they're not the, the focus. The focus is protection of water. This is a, 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 a couple of, uh, of maps from a, 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 a nature-directed stewardship plan that, we, that I participated with a number of other people in preparing a, a couple of years ago. This map, uh, which these interpretive maps are, are typical of the plans, is uh, one that looks at, at hydrological sensitivity. Uh, this analysis was led and designed by Martin Carver, who's a PhD forest hydrologist. The takeaway message from looking at this interpretive map is that all of the, the dark blue here and then this shade of blue are, are, would be listed as water conservation uh, classes four and five, which only uh, only advise very limited activities if you're talking about protecting water. I'm not going to spend more time on this. There's a lot to be said behind uh, this design, but you you can see just by the coloration on the map that <clears throat> that it's difficult to find places where in a watershed if you're focused on watershed protection to carry out very to carry out much of, 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 of any kind of kind of extractive use. <clears throat> what follows that 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 hydrologic sensitivity in a nature directed stewardship plan is a protected landscape network. So this shows uh, uh, for example, the dark green are old growth areas to protect. Uh, you can see uh, that there's, they actually override uh, some of the hydrologic sensitivity. But what, what ends up being here is that you see very small areas uh, that uh, can be used carefully for something like <clears throat> ecologically designed forestry. So these plans uh, oper operate on time frames of 250 to 500 years plus. These are ecological time frames, uh, not the time frames of one-year profit and loss statements uh, or, uh, or, or uh, short-term planning cycles. But they're they're plans that generations of people live through and tweak uh, as as necessary through time. So you can think of the time frame for these plants as encompassing a wide range of, uh, of the elements of natural systems, uh, from the lifespan of salmon to the lifespan of trees, uh, to the, the perpetual life of water, to the, the millennia long lifespan of the rocks and minerals that make up the stream bed. The uh, priorities of nature-directed stewardship are increasingly focused on ecological restoration. But the first priority is to stop making the mistakes that create the need for restoration. Jetty Creek is a really good example of where we need to stop making those mistakes. And because all ecological restoration can do is assist natural processes to reestablish natural ecosystem composition, structure, and function was eventually over a long period of time, decades and, and centuries, will bring back the high quality water, uh, the moderate timing of flow, and the right quantities of water at the right time. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, it's important to remember that every clear cut is a restoration area. This is Galliano Island, which is in the Gulf Islands between the, the mainland of British Columbia and Vancouver Island. 
It was extensively logged. I've been involved in and am still involved in a, a project that's been ongoing for 25 years or more to begin to restore uh, a Douglas fir plantation back to its natural composition structure and function. Fortunately, the logging was messy. As you can see in this picture, there's lots of fallen trees that we've been moving around, creating some holes. And uh, 25 years later, we're starting to see a much more diverse forest that begins to look like natural for forests once did in the area. This is a, a, a protected uh, landscape network, like I'm suggesting for Jetty Creek, that's uh, for the Shawnigan Lake watershed. And its focus is on ecological restoration of water quality, quantity, and timing of flow. You can see the whole network of, of protection uh, and for and with linkages, uh, with biodiversity nodes, all the streams, uh, riparian ecosystems are protected. This, this is the kind of plan that you could prepare for Jetty Creek. This is a, just a, a small focus of the Shawnigan Lake watershed, which shows you an area that the community and the ecosystems uh, were, were, the ecosystems were resilient enough and the community uh, thought that forestry could continue at some uh, level. But forestry done right leaves full cycle trees. And all, first of all, the network through here is part of the protected network, so it's not being disturbed. Uh, but the little green dots all represent 30% uh, uh, of the, the natural tree structure there left permanently as full cycle trees to maintain things like water function, uh, but uh, also to grow old, die, and replace that, that decayed wood to maintain uh, the system through long periods of time. So I want, I want to kind of uh, wrap this up with some words from one of my favorite philosophers. Uh, the Dalai Lama reminds us if humankind continues to approach its problems, from the perspective of temporary expediency, future generations will face tremendous difficulties. Uh, we're really seeing that now in many ways, not only with a lack of water conservation, uh, but also with all of the, the problems that come with climate change. So let me just end by reminding you that this all starts with a drop. And also, uh, I would like to take the time to just quickly read these wise words uh, from Harold Johnson, who sadly a couple of years ago uh, left us. But uh, he wrote this as uh, for the back cover of one of my books, and I liked it so much that I put it as the beginning. Ecosystems are not planned. There are no geometric formulas, no hierarchies no use or users, an ecosystem is life. They can be as fragile or as strong as a spider web and spider, the trickster has no agenda, no plan. He shows us the connections, gives us his ever-changing diagram of wholeness, recreates the plan every night with slight variations and presents it, presents it to the morning sun. Super string theory suggests that all matter and energy is made up of extremely tiny vibrating strings. Some Aboriginal peoples remember that spider created the world, spun it, and now as the trickster maintains it, takes care of it, repairs it. Any attempt to plan an ecosystem must take into account that spider will play tricks, turn our best attempts to control or modify into meaningless messes, or worse, turn our pitifully inadequate assumptions about how things really work against us. So let's remember we're part of nature. And if we're going to make this work, we need to think like an in intact ecosystem and stop uh, thinking about these foolish notions uh, of not, not listening to good indigenous knowledge and science. Thank you.
Oh, I believe you're muted. Still muted. There should be a, there you go. Got it, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Herb. That was fascinating information. Your your focus on the drop of water is so resonant and it mean, makes so much sense. Uh, and your description of the nature-directed path to a new re relationship with, na with nature, that humble path, that's, that's really very important information. Thank you so much. Um, before I start asking the questions that people have posed, I'd just like to ask you, is there anything that I omitted during my introduction that you think people would need to know or ought to know? Uh, no, I think it was fine. It was, uh, Great. Uh, okay, well, I'm gonna start with a question that was posed by Nancy Webster and Anna Kaufman, and they wanna know about um, some specific recommendations for uh, restoration at the at Jetty Creek Watershed in the context of, of creating a meaningful mess. What do you think are the, some of the aspects of an ecological restoration that that we need to think about in restoring the the uh, Jetty Creek watershed, especially in the context of the possibility that there may be a change in order in ownership. Well, can you speak a little to that? Well, the the uh, the, the 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 real answer to that, or or a better answer to the question, would be to walk portions of the Jetty Creek watershed so I could get a little better feeling on the ground of what what's happened there. But based upon the the uh, number of images that people have provided to me, and and the various reports that have been done, uh, I I think I would start by uh, by putting together kind of for a moment looking at Jetty Creek and not thinking about how it's been disturbed or what's been disturbed there, but to put it in place a protected landscape network of what what needs to be protected to maintain uh, the, the, the functioning of that watershed. And I would go from there uh, to use that network of protection uh, to, uh, to, uh, to set priorities for restoration. Uh, and that, so in other words, it would actually become a restoration network if, if you wanna, wanna think about it that way. <clears throat> and coupled with that, uh, I would definitely stop all timber extraction in the watershed. Uh, there needs to be a moratorium on that, particularly uh, when it comes to clear cutting. But uh, I think given the images that I've seen to this point, uh, that, uh, that, that means uh, we need to stop doing what's causing the problems, as I mentioned earlier. So, in terms of then looking at specific kinds of restoration <clears throat> that would could occur there, uh, one of the things that I would definitely uh, say is that wherever you've got uh, remaining intact natural forests, keep them, use them as restoration anchors uh, to build out from, to to link uh, to other areas that where you're letting natural succession take place. If you've lost the natural successional plants there, reintroduce them. Uh, not, don't just plant trees, but you, you can plant a tree, but you can't plant a forest. And, and so you need to start thinking like a forest to uh, put a diversity of, of plants back there. And if you build that around that protected landscape network or, uh, or, or restoration network over time, uh, you will have, uh, you, you will slowly start to see the integrity uh, return to that watershed. Uh, removing compacted surfaces, for example, uh, reestablishing natural contours, those are all helpful too. But uh, they're, they, they're, they're also not quick, quick fixes. Uh, that's the other thing that is, uh, requires a lot of patience uh, and and uh, I dare say love from the community to to bring that back to where it once was. Great, thank you. Now, I, we have a question from the Fellies. First, an observation that uh, the Oregon 
Forest Practices Act contains a sentence like something like uh, water quality shall be maintained. That's just an observation, but the fellies ask, might decaying wood also help reduce the likelihood and intensity of wildfires? No, decayed wood, <clears throat> it's, it's, that's an interesting question because decayed wood, uh, unless, you're, unless you're talking about in the middle of a, of a clear cut, decayed wood is like a sponge that holds water. And so I, I've been in a lot of fires, uh, wildfire situations where the, what's left after a forest has burned, uh, the, the, the first thing you start to see is wood, decayed wood that might be charred a little bit, but out of that decayed wood are sprouting plants. Uh, and, and in fact, in fact, if you look at the natural regeneration of the forests uh, around you there, and if you, you walk through a, a natural forest, particularly an old growth forest, and you stand in one spot, you'll start to see uh, almost like lines of trees, not a, totally straight, but jagged kinds of lines going in, in irregular directions. If you take uh, your hands or a shovel and dig around uh, along one of those lines, you'll find decayed wood very quickly because the, the trees regenerate on that, that, that moisture rich and nutrient rich uh, because there's been lots of, of or, insects uh, defecating in that decayed wood for a long time. There's mycorrhizal or fungi uh, in, in that system. So uh, the, the decayed wood uh, is not gonna be a problem when it comes from a fire standpoint. Uh, it, the, 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 the problem is in clear cuts, it dries out and loses a lot of the functions that I, I, I just talked about, but, but it's not gonna carry a fire. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question from Craig Patterson, actually a couple. Um, Herb, can you talk about the role of soil in the hydrologic cycle? How rich, deep moisture soils under a multi-stage forest is so substantially different than soil in a clear cut. Can you touch on the aspect of soil? And as a kind of a, a second question, should we put a value on soil, not unlike carbon, to create disincentives or fines, which result in undermining the soil? Well, I like the the last idea a lot. <laughs> the the uh, I, I spent uh, a portion of my career um, a number of years ago uh, quantifying soil degradation, uh, looking at at soil degradation in different kinds of logging and comparing <clears throat> soil in natural to natural forest ecosystems. That one of the biggest differences is the soil that you find in natural forest ecosystems has a, a lot of organic material in it. Uh, it has a, a fairly heavy layer on top of organic material that also mixes uh, with the mineral soil beneath it. And <clears throat> that stores a lot of carbon. Uh, it insulates the soil from loss of water through evaporation. So it holds water and conserves water in the system that provides for a whole suite of, of life from mosses and liverworts to shrubs all the way up to trees. But, uh, and it, it doesn't, the, the carbon in that system does, breaks down very slowly because it's cool and damp uh, and, and shaded by the forest. In contrast, when in a clear cut, for example, you, you end up uh, with a lot of heat uh, and, and you lose water quickly, those, that organic material dries out and releases carbon uh, out, of, uh, out of the system. Uh, and that can be also exacerbated if you want to add in uh, slice burning, for example, which totally hastens that, that whole process. So the, the, you've got healthy soils uh, underneath the forest that hold, filter, store water. Uh, versus unhealthy soils in a, in a clear-cut logged area that are dry, they've lost a lot of carbon. They're associated with that, that 15 years of carbon dead zone uh, because nothing is bringing carbon back into the system uh, for that, that period of time uh, after, after a clear-cut. So I, I hope that at least provides some of the, 
the structure to uh, answer that question. Great, thank you, very good. Um, here's a question from Phil Chick, who dear friend happens to be the mayor of Nehalem. Um, can you give a time frame of how long it would take after planting seedlings to steward them to safely growing on their own without using herbicides? I have been told by industrial forester that if you don't apply herbicides, grasses will choke out the new trees. I have a hard time believing that mechanical methods wouldn't be as or more effective. Can you speak to that, please? Uh, yes, I can. I, I have quite a bit of direct experience doing manual treatments. Uh, in, in most cases, it's not grass that they're concerned about, except on very dry sites. And uh, if the sites were that dry, then uh, I wonder why they were even logging there because the trees wouldn't have been very big to begin with. But what most most of the time happens <clears throat> with, with competing vegetation is that it's a physical competition that uh, timber companies are worried about. In other words, uh, tall enough shrubs, uh, trees like red alder uh, that are, are threatening the growing space for that quote unquote crop tree that they want to, to maintain. And, and so in those situations, you can manually remove those trees with a brush saw, with, with a variety of different tools, sometimes even hand tools if they're, they're, they're small enough. And though if, if that's done at the right time of year, uh, which you don't want to do it uh, in the, the fall and winter, when all the, 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 the nutrients that those plants depend on are stored in their roots, because you're sending them a signal that, uh, that, that you cut off the top. So next year, they're going to grow lots of tops. But you, you can pick out windows in, in the, the late spring, early summer, where there aren't much, there aren't many reserves stored in the roots, cut them off, uh, and they won't re-sprout. And so you'll have uh, an effective kind of, of, uh, of treatment for those trees that you planted. But another thing to point out here is that, that uh, those successional species like red alder uh, and other shrubs are actually playing a really important benefit. This idea that in a bare area, we should right away plant conifers uh, and so we have a quote unquote forest back there or a tree plantation is missing a really important point because those, uh, particularly the, the deciduous or angiosperm plants raise the pH of the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, that frees up more nutrients in, in the soil. And over time, if those trees are grown along with those other plants, they grow better and bigger and faster. So it's 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 kind of a a, a a traditional forestry mindset that is being described here, but it it's not based on ecological realities. It's it's based on a, a contrived idea of wanting to have timber crop after timber crop as fast as as you can. And I think if you go back through time and look at what's happening on those areas, that the rotation period, how long those trees are grown before they're cut again, has steadily declined. And, and mm -hmm. that decline, that decline is a symptom of losing the benefits of that successional process. Thank you. It sounds like a lot of this goes to questions of time scale and how much patience we can exhibit. Um, th here's a question from Mary, again, along the lines of, of pesticide application. Mary asks, do pesticides and herbicides seep into the ground or mainly wash into waterways? Well, I, I, first of all, let me uh, start by saying I'm not a, a, an expert uh, in, in, that, uh, in those aspects uh, of pesticide uh, use, but I have read a lot of, of, of studies and talked with a lot of chemists uh, who take, who aren't working for the people that sell the chemicals, uh, they, they like to remind us that you have both effects, that they, they, it, they not only seep into the soil, 
and move <laughs> through groundwater, but they can also directly uh, contact groundwater through drift uh, of the pesticides. Uh, and they, they can be, in some cases, moved around uh, by organisms that pick them up in the soil, soil organisms, and inter be introduced into water that way. But it, it's back to the, it's back to kind of the precautionary principle to me. Why, why use artificial chemicals that are poisons uh, to, mm -hmm. to attempt to keep unwanted species, the unwanted species being actually beneficial to, to that forest uh, in order to grow timber. That's, that's, the, that's the confusion. Uh, the, there should be uh, a, an under, understanding that timber uh, is, is something different than a forest. Uh, it's, it's not, and, and we, if, if we see it that way and we use the precautionary principle, then pesticide use doesn't make much sense. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question from Bruce Coates from the Cowichan Valley Naturalist. Bruce says, we've heard studies that show that transpiration limits the forest's ability to keep water in the local system. I have not heard of studies on the simpler concept of dew to retain it. It happens during the cooler nights when humans are less active. So I love your term fog drip and I wonder how much do counteracts transpiration in a mature complex forest? Well, first of all, the idea that transpir transpiration uh, of water uh, through the stomata in the leaves uh, 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 that's triggered by uh, by by evaporation of evapo uh, str evaporation stress is somehow or another drying out the site is is not true. Uh, because uh, most of that transpiration that happens uh, rises up in the canopy, condenses, and falls back to the system. Uh, and and you, you can you can think about that even walking through a relatively dry forest on a hot summer day. Uh, you can feel it being much more humid, for example, than if you're walking along a road or in a clear cut or something like that. So, so that transpiration in and of itself is is not not robbing the the, the system of, of of water, and the I've forgotten the second part of the question, Phil. Maybe it's about uh, dew replacing the the fog drip. How much dew counteracts transpiration in a mature complex forest? Okay, well, I, I think I partially answered that by saying that 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 drips back into the system. Uh, most of it does, uh, but the, in a, in a way that what you're seeing as do uh, is really just fog drip. It's it's just water. It's humidity that is is vapor, and as it as it cools in the system, it becomes water again, uh, and it can be seen as fog. It can be seen as just water vapor uh, that that you can't really see, but it's there and it's it's replenishing the system. Right, that makes a lot of sense. So it's fascinating the the movement of air through the canopies. It's and the the movement of water. Um, we're coming up to the end of our time. I'm going to ask want to ask one more question. Um, this doesn't have a name associated, but I think it's something a lot of us are wondering. Is there a responsible way to harvest trees? Well, uh, you know, I, I've always started from the the uh, uh, kind of humble understanding that cutting and removing uh, a, a tree from a forest is an unnatural act. Uh, when trees die naturally in a forest, the bodies stay behind <laughs> to maintain the, the functioning of the system like we've talked about. That said, uh, I think if you design protected networks uh, of ecosystems that are cautious uh, and where you decide there are stable enough areas that are also socially appropriate to cut, if you leave in those areas finer scale networks of protection, uh, like fallen trees 
don't smash them up because uh, once you lose the, the, the structure, you lose the function. So, so protect them. Also uh, leave behind uh, 25 to 30 per, percent plus of the larger best trees on the site to grow old and die as full cycle trees. Then I think you can talk about realistic removal of, of, of timber in, in that way. Uh, and that, that, uh, that cuts to the chase too, to say that we need to build structures that aren't designed uh, to, with planned obsolescence. We need to use the wood that we extract from forests in wise, careful ways. So we have buildings that last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Well, thank you. That's, I think that's something that we all needed to hear. That's such good information. Herb, there, we really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your incredible expertise. And thank you so much for answering all these questions. There are a number of questions that we haven't been able to get to. I'd like to thank everyone who asked questions and I apologize to the people we weren't able to reach. But thank you again, Herb, for your time and for your expertise. It gives us a lot to think about. Um, and now I would like to introduce Nancy Webster and she is the president of NCCWP. Nancy, my question for you is, what can we do to help? I want to offer a call to action, a call to protect our drinking water sources, our waters. Historically, our coastal rainforests provided abundant and safe water. Today, these forests mostly have been replaced by tree farms that are heavily logged and sprayed. These practices have severely compromised the quality and quantity of our water. My father worked in the 50s and 60s at Weyerhaeuser as a lumber grader. He was very concerned that the tree farms were not sustainable, that the fish were in trouble, that trees were not forever. Today, I realized he was right. In Oregon, we have the, all of the waters in Oregon belong to the public. Please join our grassroots watershed protection movement from British Columbia to Oregon. Our work is to ensure that our water sources are protected and restored today for future generations. Let nature be our guide. In Oregon, let the coastal all the return and thank you everyone for attending and thanks for our organizations that participated with us thank you and thank you very much nancy and with that we have now finished our presentation for the for the evening thank you everyone for joining us thank you for the supporting organizations and especially thank you to herb hammond for your expertise and for sharing your time Everyone, please look for a follow-up email that will include a link to the recording for tonight's presentation. Thank you all. Good night.